Good evening, everyone. If everyone could take their seats now, please. on SynBioWatch.org and KPFA.org. So good evening. Good evening. Thank you very much for coming. I'm Tina Stevens of the Alliance for Humane Biotechnology. Can you turn up the mic? Can't hear. How does one turn up the mic? <laughs> I'll just talk to you from down here. Is that, is that okay? Yeah. It's not okay for me, but that's okay. <laughs> uh, on the... Um, but want to thank you very much for coming and uh, offer particular thanks to the CS Fund, whose generous grant made this evening possible. Scientists working on recombinant DNA research in the 1970s triggered public attention when they called for safeguards to protect against potential biohazards. But when the public responded, sometimes with alarm, the scientific community sought retreat from citizen scrutiny and secured methods of self-regulation. Since then, powerful financial incentives emerging in the 1980s reinforced this self-regulatory system, a system lacking adequate transparency or public participation. But the watchdog groups that emerged in the wake of early controversies never stopped watching. Last year, when plans were announced for the expansion of the Lawrence Berkeley National Lab, a number of these organizations, urging responsible science, not anti-science, took note. The expansion would result in the world's largest synthetic biology lab. Yet there was little in the lavish promotional campaign wooing cities that suggested as much. Known, formally as, known informally as extreme genetic engineering, synthetic biology is controversial. Last year, 58 organizations from 22 countries signed an open letter to the President's Bioethics Commission disapproving of its lax recommendations on synthetic biology. Earlier this month, Friends of the Earth published principles for the oversight of synthetic biology. Signed by over 111 environmental, consumer, religious, scientific, worker safety, and human rights groups from around the globe, this document calls for mandatory synthetic biology specific regulations in order to protect public health and the environment and to ensure worker safety. Yet, Promotion, public promotion of the lab's expansion did not address any of the underlying concerns that resulted in these extraordinary collaborations. The consortium of civil society groups convening tonight's forum seeks to balance hyped claims and unmask concealed risks. It seeks to give public information needed to make civic participation possible in order to sort through urgent questions. What communities are being affected, and how are they being affected? How can, can, how can these communities affect choices that are being made? How can they affect outcomes, governance, oversight, transparency, regulatory integrity? What constitutes meaningful participation? <clears throat> Tonight's meeting is dedicated to the late historian of science, Charles Weiner, who, 
After skilled chronicling of the social unrest triggered by emerging genetic technologies four decades ago, stressed throughout his distinguished career the necessity of answering these questions. It is dedicated also to the often invisible injured biotech workers who are sometimes sickened and even killed by risky experimental research. We are joined this evening by a family member of Dr. Malcolm Kasadabon, who died from a modified strain of the plague after a lab exposure. His experience and that of his family, and the experience of other lab accident victims and their families, remind us that concern about the human costs associated with the technologies that we pursue is as much a matter of securing and maintaining best practices and just redress during their development as it is of anticipating their social effects. To help us begin our consideration, the director of the International Center for Technology Assessment, Andrew Kimbrough, will moderate tonight's presentations. It is not often that we have a public forum like this. Uh, I, the first in my experience where the topic is above the fold on the front page of the Daily Newspaper. This is pretty remarkable. And, and as we look at this technology, and as someone who spent many years uh, in technology assessment, I think it's important for us to um, remember that not to approach this technology uh, which is either a new technology, as you'll hear, or an application of, of an older technology, uh, with what I call technolo technological amnesia, technology amnesia. You know, this is not the first technology that has come to us over the last several generations. We have had uh, the nuclear technology. We have had the chemical technologies, right? We have the combustion engine. And when we look back on that history, what becomes very, very clear is that when they first started the first x-rays, they did not know that we would be, for many decades, under the cloud of nuclear destruction through nuclear weapons. They did not predict that technology was going to go there. The first few chemicals, they had no idea that we look as we do at the world today with toxic waste dumps and literally millions of new molecules out there that were never thought of before. Certainly when we started the company, as a person who grew up in New York City, no one imagined what would happen to the combustion engine if you've ever gone along on an expressway at 5 o'clock in the afternoon. No one predicted that, much less the impacts, global warming, Set of that those causes. So let's not approach this technology. So let, let's 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 not approach this technology with sort of amnesia. This is not the first te technology that's been around the barn. We know that we have never limited technology to its beneficial purposes. We failed at that as a society, and we've never been able to adequately predict the consequences of the technologies we've implemented. So this form also gives us a very unique opportunity with this technology to try and get ahead of the curve, both here in this room as a society and both here in this country and globally on this new technology or amplification of old technology. This is a very unique opportunity. And fortunately, we have just the right people to help us get into that conversation. Uh, we know that it's also extremely topical here. We know about the lab in Richmond, which will be a topic of conversation both among the speakers and I'm sure in the discussion. Emeryville, of course, is the corporate headquarters for a couple of the major synthetic biology firms. And we also know that Berkeley's long-term plan for development uh, the discussions of that have been dominated by uh, our Secretary of Energy, Stephen Chu, and many of those in the synthetic biology community. So this is extremely topical. This is ground zero, very important discussion for this community. But ground zero for what? What is synthetic biology? I guarantee you that the vast majority, the vast, vast majority of the people in these communities could not answer that question. They're going to be asked to decide whether this is the right future for their communities, but they will not know what synthetic biology even is. So it's very appropriate that our first panel today is going to answer that question. What is biotechnology? I'm trying to give us a feeling for what this technology is and what it isn't, and what the scope of it may or may not be. And it's equally appropriate that our first speaker is Jim Thomas. Jim is a research program manager for the ETC group. And I have um, had the pleasure of being on many fora with, with Jim. And I can say that Jim is unquestionably the world's leading person in making the public aware and educating the, the public about this technology. So you're starting, I think, with the leading educator and public awareness expert in this technology. Jim? Thank you, Andy. Thank you. 
thank you. Um, I'm going to uh, I'm going to lay up the PowerPoint. So just hold with me for a second. And, uh, and thank you very much for so many people coming out. Um, as, as Andy says, sorry, how was, uh, um, uh, as Andy said, um, I, I work for an organization called the Etc. We're a very small organization. We track emerging technologies. Um, and synthetic biology is an area we've been tracking you know, on behalf of civil society groups probably for about, uh, about eight years or so. Um, and, and looking around this room, I'm reminded of, a, of another meeting on synthetic biology that happened in Berkeley that I watched uh, via a streaming camera, um, I think back in 2000, 2006, where there was a town hall meeting on synthetic biology and, and trying to discuss how do you uh, regulate and what are the issues raised by synthetic biology here in Berkeley. And what was noticeable was that that meeting uh, it had one or two people in the audience, and it had a few people up on the panel who were almost entirely from the synthetic biology community. Um, the critical mass wasn't there yet to discuss the issues around synthetic biology, so it's good to see that critical mass is now beginning to emerge. And, and, and I think they have a very hard task here uh, to, to describe very quickly what synthetic biology is. Uh, the President's Bioethics Commission last year, the question came up, what is synthetic biology? And uh, it was Drew Endy from Stanford, who some of you will know, said, listen, chill out, you're not going to get a definition on this one. Um, and as many of you, there are a number of people here in the room who are in the synthetic biology community. I recognize people who, who, who know this, this, this very deeply. So hopefully we'll have a bit of a discussion on that. Um, and then following me is going to be uh, Professor Ignacio Chapella. And um, I think he and I are going to give a bit of a yin-yang presentation. Um, I'm, I'm going to suggest what synthetic biology is, the standard version. I'm going to tell you the Wikipedia entry. Um, and uh, Professor Chapella, a practicing microbiologist at UC Berkeley, will, will talk a little bit more about what it really is. And, and so some of what I'm going to say, some of, this, some of the language, some of the fantastical claims I'm going to make, um, please do uh, have a little skepticism in the back of your mind. There's a, there's a lot of language and metaphors here that um, we may want to test how real they are. Um, but I think one thing that, that's, that's indisputable is what synthetic biology is. Actually, it's less than science and technology. It's an industrial plan. It's an industrial strategy. It's a plan to use biology and, and the engineering of biology um, to make stuff biologically. And, uh, and what's very clear is that there is an actual synthetic biology industry taking root specifically here in the Bay Area, but. Uh, other places too. And uh, that industry, I'd say there's somewhere around 50 to 100 maybe, synthetic biology startups. So maybe as many as that. Many of them are still in uh, stealth mode. Um, and many of them are right here. Here's a, a map we put together of the, the Bay Area labs that are, are synthetic biology labs and the companies. It's a long list of companies here, over 20. And I'm sure there's many missing there. Some of you will know which ones are missing. Um, a lot of these uh, are, are companies that are attempting to see if they can use the engineering of biology, um, the, the, a set of extreme genetic engineering techniques in order to make biofuels, bioplastics, um, natural products and microbes and so forth. And, and behind them is, is uh, a, a number of investors, and um, particularly some of the world's largest companies. So if you look at the top 10 energy corporations, um, there they are, six of those. Six of the top ten energy corporations, at least, have investments or joint ventures in synthetic biology companies. Um, here's the top ten chemical companies. Six of them have investments or joint ventures with synthetic biology companies. One of them, I'd say, DuPont, increasingly is a genetic, synthetic biology company. There's, there's so much of its strategy looking forward is about using synthetic biology to make bio-based materials. Um, and then we could call this presentation the joy of six, because look, here's the top 10 agribusiness companies. Six of those as well um, have, have significant investments in synthetic biology. Um, and in fact, pharmaceuticals are the ones that break the mold. But so the top 10 pharmaceutical companies, seven of those have uh, investments in synthetic biology. Um, and what does that look like on the ground? So some of you will know Joe Heasling. Um, he's the uh, head of JBay, the Joint Bioenergy Institute, that's going to be moving to the Richmond lab and probably at the center of the Richmond lab. 
Um, also one of the, the, the leaders of SINVERC, the Synthetic Biology Engineering Research Center of the National Science Foundation, is meeting this week here in Berkeley. Uh, he's head of uh, biosciences at Berkeley Lab. Um, Jay, Jay probably represents uh, what's happening a lot in synthetic biology. He's um, founder of three companies, Amaris Biotechnology, LS9, Ligos, they produce various biofuels and biomaterials. He's on the board of two other companies, Evolver, which takes a bunch of defense money in order to make things like vanilla, um, Genomatica. Um, this was what uh, Jay said this morning in the San Francisco Chronicle about the new lab. As to the charge that the new Richmond Research Center will be dominated by corporate interests, he said it will remain completely independent of the energy industry. I'm finding this an astonishing claim. Um, here's if you go to Jay Bay's website, where they have a whole section called For Industry. So this is their strategic partners, Total, Statoil, BP, the Industry Advisory Committee, LS9, DuPont, these are, these are energy companies. This is who's going to be moving into, into Richmond. Um, and and Bay is very clear about this. They say, you know, we, we work with companies because uh, we can then, they can then leverage our facilities. Bay says, you know, we will give them intellectual property, at first dibs on intellectual property, we will give them the chance to get a significant return on investment. In fact, this is a cheap way for these companies to do research, in this case of biofuels, um, on, on the public, on the public tab. Um, and, and Amaris too, I think we have to, we have to look at, there, there, is a, there is a conflict of interest here. Um, Jay boasting again to the San Francisco Chronicle that his million shares are worth about 17 million in Amaris, well, his Here's who Amaris has partnered up with, Lexi Shell, Total, these are energy companies. Uh, I think the, the point is that what we're seeing here is, a, is the beginning of a network of, uh, of companies um, using this technology. Um, that, interestingly, these are, these are not just energy companies. You've got chemical companies, you've got cosmetics companies, you've got grain companies. This, this, uh, this technology, supposedly synthetic biology, begins to cut right across all these different areas. So why, why, why all this corporate money flowing around or, or buzzing around this synthetic biology thing? Well, there's three promises or three claims that I think the synthetic biology community are, uh, are making that they might be able to do, three possible magical tricks. The first is that they might be able to turn microbes, yeast and coli and, and, and even algae into little chemical factories, and I'll touch on that in a second. The second is Maybe they have the technology to turn sugar into oil. And the third one is maybe they can make nanorobots, broadly speaking. So microbes as chemical factories. You hear this a lot when you, uh, you look at the literature from companies like Amaris. This is yeast, brewer's yeast. It's, it's, it's a, a magical little bug that's able to make wonderful things like beer and wine. Um, but the, the, the notion is if we can if we can reprogram it, if we can put in new genes in a particular order such that it, instead of making ethanol or, or, or beer or wine, why, why couldn't it make something more like gasoline or jet fuel or something more like plastic? And, and so you have this idea that these are tiny factories that um, eat sugar and spit out an industrial commodity. And, and then these are factories that reproduce, so you have a lot of them in a vat and something like a brewery. So that's, that's the business plan for a lot of these, uh, these synthetic biology companies, re-engineering these, these uh, tiny little factories. In particular, it's interesting, if you can do that, you can spit out something like petroleum. Well, then you, you're doing a magical thing. You're turning sugar into oil. And, uh, and in a time when, when petroleum is becoming harder to access and petroleum is becoming more expensive to access and politically more expensive to access, then if sugar can become a new petroleum field, this is extremely interesting to the likes of Total and Shell and DB. Um, because those sugars include cellulose, which is the woody sugars that you get in forests. And if you can access those sugars, then all of the black parts of this map, those are the forests, those are the biomass. 86% of living plants are in the tropics here. All of those become above ground oil fields that become open and available. So sugar becomes the new oils that exists, one of the synthetic biology companies points out. Um, and you know, that's very much in the plan, as Steve Coonan, who previously was uh, at UC Berkeley leading synthetic biology work, previously he was with BP, um, now he's at the Department of Energy. 
Um, and yes, we'll, we'll go for the green parts of those. The green parts are where we want to go. It's uh, the forests. There's even a suggestion maybe we can turn carbon from the air, carbon dioxide into oil using algae. Um, there are real limitations on this, actually. But the idea is if we can engineer algae and put it in large ponds, um, and uh, maybe that will create uh, an oil. Algae does produce oil, but there's synthetic biology potentially can make uh, algae more efficient at producing oil and make it in a different way. And then this idea of tiny nano robots. Um, Drew Endy from the University of Stanford. You know, programming DNA is, is cool because you have actual living machines. That's what viruses are, or something like that. Bacteria. Um, and if you could reprogram them to start attacking different parts of the body, it's like programming a little machine, an electrical machine. Um, we'll come back to this later. So what's the actual technology here? Well, it's, it's you know, this notion that these are machines, that these are, these are factories. If they really were factories and machines, then you would have to have some instructions. And the instructions, of course, for living organisms is supposedly DNA. It's, it's letters G, T, C, C, A, T. And then if you could rewrite those letters, which is what genetic engineering has tried to do. It's tried to cut out bits of DNA from one organism and put them in another in a kind of cut and paste fashion. But if you could just write it, you could write it like you were on a typewriter, then you could, you, could, you could make your own instructions. So this is a machine called a DNA synthesizer. It's about this big, with four bottles of four chemicals, G, T, C, and A, and roughly speaking, it prints out DNA, and you have synthetic DNA. And you can then say, I want a piece of DNA that goes G, T, C, 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 A, T, C, and, and there it is, it just makes it for you. So you don't have to go and find it in nature, you can just invent it. And then you can put it into an organism, program the organism. Um, in fact, you don't even really need a machine because you can go online to someone like DNA 2.0 who are based down in uh, Silicon Valley and you can type in, I want GTTCCCA and they'll send it to you in the post at about 30 cents per letter. Um, and so that means you can just order DNA that you want and you can use that for supposedly programming um, these things. And, and so within synthetic biology, the idea is that we can make this a standard process. We can have standard commands for that program so-called biobricks. And uh, you can then put those commands together like you make circuits. So of course, Silicon Valley was built on building circuits into computers and a whole industry got built on the back of that that we now see with Apple and IBM and Google and so forth. And the idea is here we're going to build biological circuits and build an industry on the back of that as well. That's the dream for synthetic biology. And pushing that dream is things like the International Genetically Engineered Machine Competition that happens every year, I think it happened at Stanford most recently, where you have hundreds of high school students and, and undergraduates coming together to build synthetic organisms, um, to build artificial organisms that flash different colors or smell of bananas and so on. And it doesn't have to be done by high school students, it can be done by people at home. This is a woman called Meredith Patterson um, here in the Bay Area. She calls herself a biopunk here. She is in her kitchen producing uh, a microbe that will glow green in yogurt. Um, and there's a whole movement called DIY Bio. Um, particularly strong here in the Bay Area. Um, there, are, there are community labs doing synthetic biology. It doesn't need to be uh, LBNL's lab down in Richmond. Bill Gates thinks it's a really great thing. And of course, you could, you know, you can go beyond printing out these little strands. So you know, here's the full DNA sequence, all the letters for making the polio virus. Um, seven and a half thousand letters, you could, you could theoretically put that into a, into a sequencer and you could print that out or you could get all the bits and you could put them together. And um, there's a guy um, in New York um, who's done this several times, Eckhart Wimmer. He's built the polio virus probably seven or eight or nine times now, probably more than that. And it works. You put it into a, uh, into a mouse and the mouse dies. Um, or you've possibly heard about this, this is work done um, by Craig Venter, um, where he built the entire genome, all the, all the instructions, the DNA instructions for a bacteria, um, and booted it up, made it so that the bacteria reproduced, took her, all the, the instructions for a, a goat bacteria, a goat pathogen. Um, he called it JVC001, and we called it Cynthia. Um, so, so that's a, just a very quick run through. What is synthetic biology? It's, it's, a, it, it's a new industry that tries to reprogram living organisms, particularly microbes, but not just, there's also plants. Um, the idea of turning them into living factories that will turn sugar into oil or into plastics and, and so forth. And I'll leave it at that. Thank you.
great. Um, our next speaker, it's an honor actually to introduce our next speaker, Ignacio Chapella. It is never easy to speak truth to power. Uh, Ignacio knows that. Uh, several years ago, he discovered the contamination of traditional maize in Mexico by a genetic engineered varieties, wrote a scientific paper on it, and was attacked by corporations, attacked by people inside his own university here at Berkeley. Uh, he succeeded. He, he, he was able to defeat those who, uh, who, who wanted to suppress his science, and uh, since then has become a staunch, a, really, a, really the conscience in many ways, of Berkeley, and as we have seen a continuing takeover, not just at Berkeley, but around the country, of universities by corporate interests, and he has been raising the red flag whenever that's happened here at Berkeley, which is unfortunately way too often. Um, but I, and the, one of the major reasons we want Ignacio to speak next, though, is because as someone who's been looking at the science and technology for almost 30 years, uh, it is my experience that Ignacio is at the cutting edge, really, of understanding what's really going on with genetics, uh, what is hype, and what is truth. And he's going to share that with you right now. <laughs> Raise your hands when uh, you don't hear when I start drifting away from the microscope and you can hear. Uh, and I'll, I'll try to speak louder and come back to it. Um, it is a real privilege to be here in front of you. Um, in more than one way, I'm uh, really privileged to be among the very few faculty members on our campus who would even dare set foot in this meeting. I'm proud to see that there are a couple of them in the audience, and that's great. Uh, but uh, one of the things that we shine for is our incredible silence as critical voices. And I wish I could be here to speak and, uh, and, and uh, detail about a technology. Um, but I'm afraid that I do not even have the... Um, I'm sorry. Hope that they, I have a couple of photo, uh, photographs that I would like to show you, even though time is very brief. Okay, it's not going to work. I can see that. Let's just start that. Okay, that's good. Thank you. Um, I wish I could be talking about a technology, but I don't have the heart to represent to you. <laughs> um, but is that coming from the projector? <laughs> you think? Okay. 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 You know, very powerful people really love to see themselves projected in the back. And there's something really eerie about seeing in my background Microsoft. I'm happier just to have it. That would certainly not boost my ego. Uh, a technology, are we talking about a technology? The reality is that we're not. The reality is that DNA, no matter how we synthesize it or not, um, whether we synthesize it or take it out from an organism and purify it, no matter where it comes from, it is a really boring molecule. You put it in a tube, you give it all the materials that it needs to do whatever you think it's going to do, and it does nothing. <laughs> it is really the context of DNA that, um, the living context of DNA that people use to piggyback on it, to produce the things that they think they're going to produce, and to um, sell the things out there that they think they're going to sell, but most of what they're selling are ideas, our promises, our uh, hopes of an application that really hasn't happened. We continue to hear that we're always five and ten years away from the next great product and the next great breakthrough and finally we're going to be able to continue to run our cars on biofuels and so on and so forth. But the reality is that the history of biotechnology is as old as the history of nuclear power. It all starts with Vladimir Bush 
and the idea that we can have the never-ending frontier of development, innovation, development, and technological uh, app the application that would drive the world through uh, economic development. And while the nuclear power that was envisaged back in the 30s um, actually delivered, and Hiroshima and Nagasaki were very early proofs that it works. And nuclear power is a very good proof that it works. At the same time, a parallel track to run biote the biotechnological dream continued to draw blank. And to this day, even though these companies do sell stuff, they sell gallons of fuel at 50 and and $100 a gallon, and they have the Navy to buy it so they can continue their business programs and they can continue to raise venture capital and so on, even though they sometimes can produce some things, they continue to run at a loss. If you ask the real, uh, the place where the pudding is shown, which is really the markets, which is really where people want to put money into it or not, you will see that even though we have invested over 40, 50 years into this enterprise, more than 300, depending on who you ask, hundreds of billions of dollars have gone into it. And we're still yet to make a profit. And we're still yet to make a really predictable, controllable living organism that will follow the sign the way engineers would like it to follow. So I cannot really speak about that technology uh, with, with a, oh my gosh, with a, uh, with a clean conscience. I can speak about a, a form of engineering though. It's a very important kind of genetic engineering that happens and has happened and has been very successful and that, that is the genetic engineering of your public institutions. <laughs> Through a process called PPP, Public-Private Partnerships. And this is a very appropriate place to speak about it because we at Berkeley have been, many people have been very proud to be the pioneers of PPP. We uh, started uh, welcoming these private public uh, partnerships, uh, strategic alliances, what they were called, in the 90s, as a dry run to what became in 2007, 2008, uh, really model for the world on how to do this. With PPP, we uh, obtained $500 million that really very quickly distributed throughout our campus and had a very effective uh, 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 outcome leading to silence. Either because you're afraid of going against your colleagues' gain or because you're hopeful that you will be one of the winners in the draw for the $500 million. Whatever the case might be, this company, VP, gained incredible access to the deepest and most intimate capacities that you think you still have unencumbered within your private, within your public, what you still think is your public university. Many people worry about these relationships because professors become entrepreneurs, and Jay Kisling, Kisling uh, 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 Jim Thomas, forgot to mention among the many, many different titles that Jay Kisling has, that he also is supposed to be a professor in a public university. He's part of the faculty in our campus. Um, these professors become entrepreneurs, students become employees, patent holders, and so on. Many people worry about these things, but what I, I worry mostly is about the takeover and the privatization of the very soul and the very purpose, the public purpose, of the last line of defense that the public has to confront technological craziness, because synthetic biology is hardly a technology, as I say, right? And if you compromise that, if you alter it in such a way that it becomes internally transformed so that it cannot do the job it was supposed to do and yet continues to present itself to the world as if it was doing that job, you really have compromised all your capacity to deal with this type of development as a public. Many of you, and I'm going to stop because I know that Anne is probably keeping track of this, many of you might have forgotten about the development that happened in 2010, and that was a big, big explosion in the Gulf of Mexico, remember? Mm -hmm. It's been forgotten, and the reason why it's been forgotten by many 
is because it was called, it was declared solved. The problem was declared solved on August 24th of 2010 through a paper in science that was published by a very large number of scientists with very good reputations and very good uh, 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 credentials, all of them at Berkeley. The, the, the paper in science is a little bit cryptic and you know you can say, oh well, it's not about really cleaning up the Gulf, but immediately on the same day, the New York Times was also publishing an article that said, that starts the first line, says something like, the Gulf oil plume is no more. Mm. Problem gone. The paper is about how miraculously out of nowhere or somewhere, microbes appeared in the Gulf of Mexico, who ate all the oil that was floating around and cleaned it up, and then also equally miraculously went away and went home and I don't know where they were. <laughs> Many of you might have heard this story. This story then comes through the most uh, certified scientific channels, through the most public and peer reviewed and so on channels. The New York Times uh, uh, validates it and so on. What you never read as a public is that every single member of that publication team was compromised by a deal with BP itself. So the very role that we should have been playing has been compromised. Our very institution has been in genetically engineered from the inside. And to me, that is really the thing that I, I think we should all be very aware of. Uh, it has reached a point where science has become exactly the opposite of what you would expect. It, there used to be a time when science was the breaker of myths. And today, especially in this field, where people talk as though they could really so-called create life by so-called using so-called code and programming as if living things were computers and so on, science, or what is called science these days, this compromised genetic engineered science, is the proponent of myths and the perpetuator of myths. Exactly the opposite of what you would, would expect. A most perverse result that comes from something that has happened while you guys were not watching. So it's really great to see that you're aware of it, that you're looking at it, and really I look forward to seeing what you will do about it. before about uh, the 1970s and 80s when the first wave of genetic engineering hit. And um, probably for me the most impressive group uh, that began to address those uh, concerns was the Council for Responsible Genetics. Great thinkers like uh, Richard Lewinton and Ruth Hubbard, who's written a book called Exploding the Gene Myth, very much on the lines of what Ignacio was saying, uh, came to fore and really became for the, the, really the brain trust for those who are trying to better understand and then regulate that technology. Um, I should also add that the CS Fund, uh, which, is, which is generously funding so we can have this forum tonight, was right there then as well, and they started something called the Biotechnology Working Group in order to get NGOs involved. I was part of that. Uh, but a new, uh, the, the torch is passed at the Council for Responsible Genetics to uh, Jeremy Gruber, our next speaker, and uh, Jeremy has just done a fantastic job. If you've not, if you don't subscribe to Gene Watch, which is the extraordinary magazine that the Council of Responsible Jack was out, please put that on your to-do list. And also, uh, in, the books are coming back. I, I know that two books are being published, and I think I heard today from Jeremy that yet a third book is coming out. So uh, we know the, uh, the universities and uh, maybe even the schools of the universities are at risk. Uh, Jeremy's going to tell us what else is at risk, uh, potentially, with this technology. Thank you, Andy. So I'm not going to be talking too much actually about synthetic biology. I'm going to be talking about laboratory safety because of course 
The reason we're all here is to talk about a new lab that's been proposed for Richmond. So my, my task uh, today, or this evening, is to give you a very quick primer of what's involved in lab safety. Uh, obviously, there's a lot involved, and so these slides will be available, uh, hopefully, on, uh, on the website um, of the event, and I appreciate the organizers for inviting me uh, to come. There are a lot of guidelines uh, out there uh, relevant to different forms uh, of lab safety. The problem is, is that the guidelines are very much just that, guidelines. Uh, there uh, is uh, a lack of oversight, a lack of enforcement, and very much a limitation in what the guidelines uh, on different areas of biolab safety are able to do, which means that for the vast majority of labs operating in this country, uh, the uh, safety regulations are largely uh, through self-regulation, uh, not through oversight and enforcement of other agencies. And so when you hear a lab, uh, any lab, tell you that they are uh, following uh, the regulations, mm -hmm. uh, take that with a grain of salt. The regulations are limited, and the enforcement is poor. So why is biosafety important? Well, biosafety is important because if the researchers uh, in the bio labs are doing what they are supposed to be doing, um, accidents can happen. Uh, bio labs are, by their very definition, a man-made uh, uh, venture, and people make mistakes. Uh, we have biosafety guidelines to ensure that those mistakes are minimized and that the accidents uh, uh, do not uh, reach the facilities themselves. Uh, unfortunately, they do. Uh, the goal, of course, is to ensure that we do not have workplace injuries, that we do not have uh, property laws and unintended environmental releases and damages, but they do occur. So what is biosafety in terms of the different levels? <coughs> biosafety, uh, when we talk about biosafety, we're talking about the way that we both construct labs and design equipment within labs to ensure that both the workers on the front lines in bio labs and the community at large are safe. Uh, the guidelines that are promulgated by the NIH, National Institutes of Health and CDC, outline four stages of biosafety, starting from uh, a minimal level, biosafety level one, uh, labs that are working with agents that uh, are not infectious to humans all the way to biosafety level four, uh, highly infectious uh, exotic agents for which uh, there is no treatment. Again, barriers uh, that uh, biolabs uh, must construct are both primary barriers, that are barriers in terms of what the workers themselves must have, clothing, uh, breathing apparatuses, uh, and then of course secondary barriers, actual structural uh, barriers within the facility itself to ensure that it's safe. And that's an important distinction because secondary barriers must be uh, considered in the construction of the facility. So when we're talking about a new bio lab in a community, uh, the biosafety level designation will necessarily impact how the lab is constructed. Uh, again, biosafety levels, uh, an increasing risk uh, of, of health and safety uh, to human. Uh, laboratory locations are, uh, as you can see, all over. We have bio labs everywhere, uh, both low level labs as well as high level labs. Uh, and so uh, we have to ensure, uh, of course, that these labs uh, are safe, particularly because bio labs uh, in the United States have proliferated rapidly just over the last 10 years. In the last uh, 10 years, we've seen a tripling of biolabs operating in the United States. Uh, in the last 25 years, we've seen 1,500 symptom-causing infections from biolabs, resulting in 36 deaths uh, in the United States. And those numbers, uh, we have very poor accounting for numbers in this country when it comes to biolab accidents. Uh, the Presidential Commission that released those numbers uh, determined that they were wildly underestimated and probably double or triple those numbers. Uh, a very uh, a case in point, uh, right here in Berkeley, uh, workers who handled uh, Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever, which is uh, deadly, which can spread through the air, uh, happened uh, uh, under uh, improper conditions simply because the agent was mislabeled. 
Uh, so accidents can happen in all kinds of ways in biolabs, and they will. The lack of oversight in biolabs leads to a lack of policing, and I just want to give you two quick case examples. Uh, at Texas A&M University, um, Brucellus virus, uh, what, uh, several workers were infected with it. The university did not report it um, and until local activists actually forced the district attorney to uh, uh, create an investigation. And the CDC has dis discovered that uh, on investigation, missing pathogens, uh, additional infections, and in fact found that the CDC had actually investigated uh, the facility earlier and found no problem. So even when there is oversight by sophisticated agencies like the CDC, it is oftentimes uh, ineffective. Boston University, another example, uh, three BU researchers were infected with tularemia. Uh, that's, uh, the Soviets had actually worked with tularemia uh, a number of years ago as a possible bioweapons agent. That's exactly how, uh, how deadly it is. Uh, again, Boston University did not uh, properly reported to the CDC. They waited several months to report it to the uh, Department of Public Health, um, and the Department of Public Health found uh, that, uh, uh, that it was a major concern uh, for the community, that it had not been reported. Uh, and it's important also to understand exactly when, when regulatory apparatuses do work, um, how effective they are. In the case of Boston University, uh, the Occupational Safety and Health Administration actually did come in after the fact and investigate, and, and based upon what they found, finally found, fined the university $8,000. <laughs> so three, three individuals infected with a deadly virus under improper conditions, not reported to the community or, 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 or public health officials, and for all of that effort, all they received was an $8,000 fine. So, when it comes to synthetic biology, and this will be the one time I will talk about synthetic biology, uh, it's, in, it's particularly important to note how synthetic biology and biosafety today in the U.S. Um, are a bit at odds. Because biosafety levels, the way they're designed today, are designed are based upon predictability. The predictable properties of whatever agents are being worked at in the lab, that determines how, how the lab is classified in terms of safety levels. Um, but with synthetic biology, what you're doing is you're taking relatively innocuous, low-level agents, and you are working with them to create new properties. So the, the regulations are completely incompatible with synthetic biology because they look at the agents as they enter the laboratory, not how they change within the laboratory. Um, and the emergent properties that can be created and the risks from those emergent properties uh, are oftentimes not contemplated by current biosafety regulations. It's also a particular uh, concern because synthetic biology, as compared to a lot of other areas of biology research, involves the input of people from a lot of different fields. It's very much a cross-disciplinary pursuit, and so you have people who are engineers and, and from other fields <coughs> Coming in, these are people without biosafety training. Um, these are people who are unfamiliar with biological laboratory health and safety issues. Uh, and so not only do you have the science incompatible with the biosafety uh, regulations, but you oftentimes can have the personnel uh, uh, incompatible as well. Uh, environmental reviews. One of the first things that happens when you construct a bio lab is you're gonna have an environmental review. Um, sometimes they are at the state level, sometimes also at the federal level. Bio, uh, environmental reviews are conducted uh, initially by whatever entity uh, is constructing lab. In this case, it would be the LVNL or, or an agency on behalf of the LVNL. Environmental reviews uh, are notoriously limited. Um, the, agent, the, the state agencies that oftentimes have to uh, review them uh, have none of the background and experience to actually understand and appreciate the issues that are oftentimes raised in environmental uh, uh, reviews. And it's oftentimes only through litigation, uh, after environmental reviews have been offered to the community, uh, that those reviews have been as properly assessed and improved upon. Uh, two examples again, uh, in the case of the facility at Fort Detrick, um, the initial environmental review, review done by the lab there found no problems, no health and safety problems in the community. Uh, a review by the National Academy of Sciences 
uh, found it completely insufficient that they had not contemplated uh, many of the health and safety issues involved in the laboratory and required that the lab uh, redo their environmental impact assessment. Secondly, uh, in the case, again, of Boston University, um, the National Research Council found uh, that the University of Boston, in their own environmental review, uh, had been insufficient. This is, of course, after individuals from within the community had sued both in state and federal court uh, the lab based upon their environmental review. Uh, that la uh, lab then produced a secondary supplementary review, which had been, was then reviewed by the National Research Council and found defective. So the lab did two reviews after three separate litigations. And after all that, the review, and in this case, the review was done by the National Institutes of Health, perhaps the most, uh, the agency with the most uh, sense and ability about these issues. Uh, and it was still found deficient, so deficient that for the first time ever, the National Institutes of Health had to actually redo their policies uh, in terms of environmental <coughs> impact assessments with labs because their current policy making was found to be ineffective in the case of Boston University. So these are some of the questions that any community for which a bio lab is going to be constructed are going to have to contemplate. What safety levels will that campus house? What pathogens are being used for research? Uh, in the case of the, the lab in uh, uh, the, the LVNL lab, there are going to be different entities uh, working so what, uh, with different guidelines. So what is the overarching guidelines going to be? Um, what remedies are going to be available? What is the safety infrastructure with the community? If there's an accident in the facility, how is the community going to respond? How, uh, very basic safety services, fire, uh, uh, emergency services. How are they going to be, uh, be work? Are, is there a plan in place? Um, will the LVNL commit to a, to a transparent and comprehensive risk assessment? Uh, oftentimes, low-level labs are not required to complete comprehensive risk assessments. So it's incumbent on the community to hold the lab accountable to, to do uh, exactly that. Will the lab be developing uh, specific health and safety procedures for synthetic biology? Um, when, the lab, when any lab says that, that they are uh, working consistent with current regulations when it comes to synthetic biology, that's meaningless. There are no regulations when it comes to synthetic biology. If, if the uh, Lawrence Berkeley lab wants to be on the cutting edge um, of science, that's yeah. great. They should also be on the cutting edge of safety and health regulations for the community. Right. Uh, to make sure that, that the lab's work on an ongoing basis was transparent. Because it's important to note that whatever the lab says they're going to do, and whatever the lab does, starts doing on the first day of operation, if they begin operating, uh, it will be very de different the next year and the year after. Research changes, research develops in laboratories. So it's important that the community not only have transparency at the beginning of this process, but also that they have transparency uh, at the, uh, on an ongoing basis as well. So finally, I just like to say that uh, in terms of how I, I at least think you should be viewing uh, this issue, this is really about what is a good name. Uh, the LVNL is not constructing a uh, housing project in the community. They're not constructing a shopping center in the community. They're constructing very, something very specific, a bio lab, a bio lab involved in synthetic bio research. <coughs> there are very specific things uh, involved in that. Uh, particularly from a health and safety uh, standpoint. Uh, the one thing, uh, we haven't heard a lot from the lab, so we really don't know a lot. But what we do know is what they haven't said. And that's been, and what, and that's been a year of promoting the lab, uh, talking about the lab to, the, to a lot of different communities, and a year of where they've been completely silent on health and safety issues. Uh, I think it's incumbent upon the lab uh, to continue a dialogue with the community where they start talking about health and safety uh, issues because they are a real uh, and important concern for Richmond and for any community that has a, a bio lab and a synthetic <coughs> biology lab in particular.